the uh, 2022 FIS Continental Cup in Park City, Utah. <laughs> Hold on, I got I got like all sorts of stuff, guys. So we're running comms. Yeah, Nate, I got you. Um, I'm getting real time uh, updates from the uh, production trailer as well as the jury here in the tower with me. And uh, we're just kind of waiting for the first round to get going here. Wait, are, are we going to be able to watch this live on stream as well? That's the plan. Oh, it should be coming go. in right Let's now. Go. Look at that. So we had a little bit of a pause here, just to give everybody a little heads up. Um, so one of the women fell pretty hard. She like wrecked it into the boards. I'll show you in a second in the trial jump. So we're finishing up the trial round a little bit late. Um, just FYI. So this is number 11. Um, I don't have the start list in front of me, but I'll pull it up. That looks to be, I think that's one of the American girls. Um, Devin, I'll shoot you the, the start list. Right, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a jumper going at. first. I don't know who this is. That's here comes the replay. Oh, you're muted. Hold on. There you go. I can hear you now. Awesome. I yeah, think you're, I hear you. Uh, so here we are on number 12 and I'll shoot you guys both uh, or everybody. I'll put it in the chat here, the start list to the event. So right now we're finishing up the women's trial round. We just already did the men's Nordic combined trial round and we're going to get, get uh hammering right into the competition here in a minute. So, um, so when we say so, trial round, everybody gets a practice before the everybody gets comp. a practice before the comp. I mean, this is like, we're, I feel like we're kind of cutting edge here, Devin, like, Bob and I kind of dreamed this up a week ago, like, hey, let's put our event live on FanFest, welcome the world in, and, and then also bring some people in to, to kind of watch it with us. I love it. I think this is this is great. Uh, and, you know, obviously ski jumping is my sport. If I were to pick a winter sport, that's the one I'm, I'm gravitating to just because I feel like I could jump out the gym. Um, I got to learn how to ski first. Yep. <laughs> but that's, you know, it looks like it looks like the tracks are pretty steep and and, uh, you know, I can figure that out in a few uh, months, I think. Absolutely. So, you know, this is kind of a Nordic show tonight. We got a couple of the top athletes in the world, um, about 15 of the best women and 20 of the best men's Nordic combined skiers in the sports. Um, and Devin, Allen, you and I have hosted some of these shows together. But my guess is this is going to be a little bit more of a Nordic uh, fan uh, watching tonight. So I just want to introduce you. Devin Allen is the top American in the 110 hurdles, which I think for most of us, you know, winter athletes, we think about amplitude and speed and uh, adrenaline, but you know, none of us are really analyzing how fast we are compared to the rest of the people in the world. It's more based on the overall of uh, putting it all together. So Devin is one of those, those people that's absolutely one of the best in the world, just at running fast, jumping high and all around just all-star athlete. And he's also been an incredible host for this series. And tonight, Devin, take, you know, tell us a little bit more. Why are you joining and, and what are we looking for? Yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, like Billy said, yeah, I'm a U.S. hurdler, competed in 2016 Olympics, 2020 Tokyo Games, um, got fifth in Rio and fourth in Tokyo. I was the number one ranked hurdler last year in the world. Um, and yeah, you know, as an athlete, um, I also played two sports in college. I played college football, um, was one of the leading receivers in the 2014 season where we went to the national championship, played Ohio State. So, you know, I'm super interested in just all athletics in general, which is, you know, why I'm such an Olympic sports fan, winter sports fan. And I like to see the similarities between winter sports and summer sports. And we kind of talked through this whole series on how similar the training can be, you know, how similar the mindsets are for all the athletes. And so, you know, just getting to be a part of, of learning the events that, you know, we're watching today with ski jumping. And we talked about Nordic, you know, cross-country skiing. We talked about speed skating during the segment as well. Uh, a lot of interesting things. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm here doing a live stream with you, Billy. Me and you have been kind of in and out of this show for the last uh, month here, which has been really great getting to know you as well. And I'm excited to, uh, to watch this event and kind of just, you know, live stream slash watch party the, the event while you kind of give me the rundown of what's important, you know, what we're looking for, um, you know, leading into the, the, the competition. Absolutely. So um, that was a, a word from one of our sponsors, uh, Team Magnus Mini Skis. It's been a, a great partnership, but we're, uh, we're, we're jumping in here. We're going to start out with the uh, men's Nordic combined event. So earlier today, 
uh, we hosted uh, a race, which is a kind of a reverse format of what we normally do. So normally the jumping happens first and then, and then we have a race, which is based off of the jumping. So, you know, if you win the jumping, you start first and everybody has a handicap based on how much shorter they jumped, but the first person across the line wins. Today, we did it the opposite. So it was a mass start race. And I'm actually going to cue this up. We're going to watch the replay from today. And uh, Devin, you're going to recognize a couple of the guys. Yeah, we talked to him before, right? Got it queued up. Yeah. So I, so literally we're probably on a 30 second delay off of this no, meeting right outside this window. Um, you know, so I, honestly, Devin, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to showing you and the folks at home, like what actually goes on behind the scenes a little bit during some of the pauses we have today. Oh, for sure. And I think too, something interesting, you know, if you're a first time viewer of this event, like you said, doing the flip flop, probably doesn't happen a lot, right? Where they do the race first, right? And then and then the jump. So it's kind of interesting, right? With the jump, you're like, hey, you know, I jumped this far. I need to ski this, you know, 15 seconds faster than the guy ahead of me to catch him or, you know, vice versa. And, and the new format you, got, you guys got going today, you already did the race. So now you know exactly how far you need to jump in order to win. So that's what's going to be cool. cool is as the person gets on the bar, we're literally going to um, be able to say what it's going to take for them to take over that lead. You know, yeah. so if the jumper before them, you know, skied a few seconds slower and then jumps 80. They already had a, me a meter in their pocket to take the lead. We'll know that they need to go 79 to out jump that person. And if they go 85, then the next person, you know, has to go 87 I, or 88. I, I feel like this, this might be the, the order it needs to go in. That makes it a little bit more like, it makes it easier to jump at night. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Well, and yeah. And it's a little bit like sudden death, right? Cause you only get one jump. One jump to rule them all. Exactly. Right. So like you already, you already raced that's done. And, um, now you have one jump to kind of, you know, it's like the final jump, final jump and long jump, right? You got two yep. guys, you know, tied per se, and you're trying to, you know, I'll tell left. you what, since I'm going to, I'm going to go get an update quick here from the, uh, from the tower, but I'm going to, I'm going to see how our guys in the production trailer are doing. Hey, Nate, you got a copy. Maybe yes, maybe no. So I'm going to try to get them to ro roll the, uh, the, the replay from this morning. And some combination of radios and text messages. We're going to show you this race. See, this This is the great thing about this show as well as, you know, me and you get to be live and are just are, are making it work. We got a couple of producers. Shout out Bob, producer Bob in the back. Helping us I'm, out, helping us run it. I'm loving all the, the people that are popping on too. So, hey, Tia Libin, she's a grant writer for USA Nordic. I saw her pop in. Maxim Gliefka is one of our up and coming Nordic combined athletes who actually just uh, went to the world junior championships in Poland last week um, as a ski jumper. So it's cool to see people joining in to watch this. And we, we have done a lot of live stream over the years. Um, uh, yes. Oh, sorry. What, uh, what event just happened like last week? Um, that was so we had world junior championships and also world cup finals okay so, world cup finals so taylor and jasper and ben and um and uh i think it was actually taylor jasper or sorry taylor ben and jared who you met i think at least two or three of those guys they went over to oslo norway who did jasper didn't retire who's whose last race was it taylor taylor last weekend yeah, because I, I saw the I actually watched the finish and they like sprayed him with champagne. That was pretty cool. You know, it's interesting. Uh, so folks at home, I've done a lot of live stream. Um, I can tell you these guys think they're rolling the uh, the the replay right now and it's not coming up. So we've got uh, Team Magnus Miniskis. I'm I'm watching. I think I'm watching the live stream still. This is the live stream. And so they have they have full control. If you've ever been inside a production trailer, that's almost worth a, a world's greatest episode in and of itself. There's a lot of different things going on.
So is is this the is this the number one partner? Uh, they they are a, an excellent partner. You know, obviously they they really just focus on kids skis, but you know, for our okay. community, they um, they really work well. Uh, I was gonna, I was gonna say I was like those skis look a little bit smaller than yeah than the ones you guys are using. Is there is there any is there any like legal ruling on the 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 length of skis? I know that the skis change based on the person's size, but there's is there like a max length ski or? Yeah, there is. It's actually so it's it's a uh, hundred and forty six percent of your height. Okay, so, so that's if the you're max. if you're I'm five ten, so I max out at two hundred and sixty centimeters. It's almost eight feet plus or minus. But for every you know centimeter you are taller or shorter, your skis get a little bit longer, yeah, a little bit shorter. Now. Yeah, so. So five ten. So if I'm six one, what do I get? I get you would get like half. a one eighty or yeah. sorry, two eighty, two seven. Uh, no wait, I'm a two sixty. So you're about yeah, two seventy, two seventy. Yeah, a little bit and, longer than Taylor's. And, and and with that, does the you know because I know height, weight, and all that stuff matters. Does the weight change, or they do they try to keep it the same weight? Um they so the weight is actually part of the rules as well in the past it used to be the lighter the better but that obviously became pretty unhealthy and i won't exaggerate mm -hmm. there were literally athletes that were my size that were 30 pounds less than i am um, and that was for the ski jumping only athletes so they actually developed a bmi function which you can only have the skis as long as you're allowed to have them if your body weight is at least about a 19 and a half bmi with your suit and boots on all right, it looks like we're getting ready to roll some four jumpers here. Um, I'll tell you is what. This, is this is this the final? This is the finals. This they already ran through all the practice. They did. Yeah. So to... actually, the athletes that you see kind of getting ready right now. Yep. Are um, they're basically like the pre jumpers? They're the ones who are there for for a number of reasons. A to make sure the track's clear. Um, B if it starts to snow to kind of ski it in. Um, so that the competitors have the freest track possible, you know, after a crash, after a technical break for television, et cetera, they're always going to send a four jumper and they'll send a few right before this round starts. So, you know, Devin, this is, uh, this is certainly a, a big event for us. And I just want to thank a couple of our partners real quick. So backcountry.com is, has been, a, an amazing, uh, apparel and outerwear partner for us. And it was actually really cool. It was founded by my childhood hero, Jim Holland, who was a 94 Olympic ski jumper. Um, and it's one of the biggest uh, online retailers of backcountry gear. And now they, they do a lot of their own clothing. So that's what our team is rocking all year. We also have the Summit County Restaurant Tax Grant, which has been very supportive of this event and many other nonprofits in our area, as well as obviously the state of Utah. They do a lot with the marketing dollars to help promote the tourism that our state relies on. So Utah Life Elevated, a proud partner for the FIS Continental Cup, I think for the fourth or fifth year in a row. So really cool to have have them behind us. Um, you know, since we are waiting, and again, that fall created a bit of a hold, my guess is we're going to start rolling here in a couple minutes. Um, Devin, I'm going to walk over to the tower, but I'm going to bring you with me and just give you a little peek behind the scenes. We're going to go Ooh. talk to the competition staff while uh, our first four jumper gets ready to go. Um, so there's so a lot going on in this tower. So, so my question, right? It's it's seven seven thirteen there, Park City time. It is seven thirteen, Park City. Com com competition, competitions. Uh, this is uh, Vladu. He's the uh, technical director from the International Ski Federation. Right. Nice. Nordic Combine. Uh, we have some of our competition secretaries here: Joanna Locke and Barry Nan, um, Rothschild, Lindsey Van, a former world champion in ski jumping. Looks like she's taking some notes on a start list. And chief uh, chief of competition is Keith Hansen here studying uh what's coming at us so oh, guys saw somebody um, fly by we're gonna be on 715 awesome all right Devin, we're about to get going here alan johnson the grandfather of the sport here in the united <laughs> states no that's great so we're getting ready for bib number one right now and Devin, again with the delay from a production truck to what we're seeing and the folks at home we'll see at the same time everybody else does but it's it's typically about a 30 to 40 second delay Okay. So whatever's happening on our screen actually already happened. Which makes seconds. all of all of live television a lot more challenging than you would think. Oh, 100 percent Okay. So and were you able to pull up that start list? Yep. So is that an order? Eight. Um, 
let's talk about this. So we've got, uh, let's see here. Starting first for the men's Nordic combined uh, will be, uh oh, did I send you the same link twice? I might have. We're going to have Pavel uh, uh, from Poland. He's our sole Polish competitor. Okay. Looks, looks like we're trying to put graphics up. We're all sorts of fun tonight. Folks, I, I got to tell you, it's like having built a production trailer and been out in the field stringing fiber optic cable to make all this kind of stuff happen. That's actually one of our four jumpers. That's a Park City uh, young jumper named Ryder. Okay, I, I have a I have a quick question because I'm yeah, looking at this uh, this uh, start list. So we're talking total points. What's the goal? Highest points or lowest points? The 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 goal is highest points. So right now you're going to get a composite score. Yeah. That's our last four jumper. Looks like he's having a little trouble in the air, but I think that's more him than anything else. It's a beautiful night out. Um, the composite score for the jumping is is the distance. The judges scores. And there's a bit of a factor about the conditions like wind, mm -hmm. um, but that's a pretty minimal factor in most competitions, especially a night like tonight. But with the Nordic combined, we're going to actually have, um, we're going to have the, uh, the race will be like the beginning of their score. So 120 points is what uh, the winner of the race, which was Taylor Fletcher will start with. Okay. And then he's going to add his jumping score to that. But now we're going to start with Pavel uh, Zindler of Poland. And in the first round, if you, if you go to that live ticker, which is, is available on the FIST website, you'll see you've got Pavel Slim Sindler starting in first and his points coming into this, it looks like he's got 25.5 points, which he'll add to now with his jumping score. And we'll be able to see this coming out. And that's going to be is, is it as simple as just adding the distance. It is. Score? Yeah. Okay. Well, so the distance actually, the, they get a 1.5 points per meter. So he just went okay. 77.5 points or sorry, 75.5 meters. Yeah. So that will get added to his cross country score. So his actual score, Pavel's, was 17.5, which would be added to his cross country score to get the, the final ranking. Okay. So, so that was his first jumper. We're, that was we're, jumper number we're one. We're, we're competing for all the marbles now. We are now. So jumper okay, number okay. two is Eric Lynch. Eric comes out of the Steamboat Springs Winter Sports Club. He was on the national team quite a while ago, but he's struggled with some major health issues related to Lyme disease. And so it's really amazing that he's back competing because he literally had to live in a clean room and he's just been training kind of by himself for a long time. And he's finally getting his health back. And it looks like he had a pretty good jump, almost to 80 meters there. So he's likely to to go flying right past uh, yeah, Pavel. And, and is the jump back order in order of like leading to not leading? Like it's going from start? it's going from the the person who yeah. crossed the finish line last, and okay. then it'll go through to Taylor who won the race today. Okay. And so Taylor's starting with an advantage. So we'll know pretty much right before he jumps what he has to do in his jump to retain the lead. And we're okay. going to kind of know that as we go through this. So this is Gunnar Gilbertson um, of Steamboat Springs as well, but he's a member of the USA Nordic Junior National Team. He actually just had the longest jump at the Junior World Championships last week. So he's like one of our major up-and-comers. And t talk me through the, those lines real quick. So that big blue line, what is that? Is that like a 60 meter mark, 70 meter mark? So the, so the, the, the jump that we're on tonight is an HS 100 and hill okay. size is what HS stands for. That means it's basically the longest distance that the jump is safely designed to have. So as they come down the ice track and they leave the takeoff, yep. they're immediately covering 50 meters before they even get over that knoll. That blue line is at 80. The mm -hmm. red line, the first of the red lines is at 90, and that last one is at 100 meters. So tonight we're likely to see a jump close to or right around 100 meters. If and they that's go much like further, the furthest than that, you can do safe, really safely. Really safely, you know, given the right conditions. Not all safe, right yeah, jumper, yeah. You could go about 105 on this hill, but you're really starting to push your luck. So Gunner handily took over the lead right now with a with a great jump. Um, and actually, I can pull that up. 
If you guys are at home and you like what you're seeing, this can all be seen live on the FIS International Ski Federation app. And this is Domenico Mariotti from Italy, who's the fourth of our athletes to compete tonight. Looks like he squeaked over the uh, the 80 meter mark. Gunnar Gilbertson went 82. Domenico, we're waiting for the distance now. And looks to me like he pops in. Let's see here. Ah, he popped in at 83. So he slightly passed over Gunnar Gilbertson to take the lead. And then now we have number five, Grant Andrews. And Grant's one of the, he's kind of in the peer group, peer group of Jasper and Ben Loomis age-wise. He might be a little bit younger. So he's one of our, um, he's kind of like part of the depth of our field right now. You know, we have the mm -hmm. five athletes we sent to Beijing. And then we have another 10 athletes that are really kind of like right on that world elite I, circuit. I, of the feel like, yeah, I feel like you guys have been talking about Ben and Grant the last few times we've, we popped on. Yep. So here comes Grant. He did not get a ticket to Beijing this time around, but he's certainly tracking uh, to that level. Grant is definitely known a little. Oh, and that was kind of what happened earlier when I when we right before we came in live. One of the one of the female athletes, one of the women, um, had a little trouble right there at the end of the outrun. It's a bit icy, I think, as the mm -hmm. sun goes down here in Utah. That outrun and, starts to, to and that up. doesn't that doesn't affect the scoring. It does not. Well, so not that far out. Yeah, there's a line, and I'll try to point it out to you. But about 50 meters past the curve where they land. There's yeah. a line. If you keep everything nice and pretty to there, theoretically, there should be no deductions. If you okay. do touch or fall before that, anything you do before that is judged. So okay. here comes our uh, one of our Norwegian competitors, Lars Burris. He's one of the fastest athletes. Um, he was one of the uh, the Europeans who was able to make the trip. But in this weekend, because not the whole team was able to come, Team USA is actually supporting him for coaching and waxing. But you can see at a really nice jump. Ooh. I imagine that will easily a 90 meter you. mark. Yeah, that's 87 what? and a half meters. Are we going off the front skis or the back back? So you actually mark where the feet land. So oh. if they land together, there's actually video cameras that are they basically grid out the entire jump and they mark them. Okay. Um, if they land in a telemark, which is kind of one foot in front of the other, which is the back more foot. stylish way to land, they uh they mark right in the middle of where the two feet hit. Oh, okay. And I got one more because we're watching this one live. Are you allowed to push off that bar? You can do, yep. You can or absolutely you want. push off that bar. Oh, so this know, is Jasper. We Jasper. We the, what's that? We know Jasper. Yeah, we do. Here we go. Come on. Jasper had a great race today. So he enters this in 10th place. Very easily could take the lead handily right now because he hung in a very tough pack. So he's not super far behind the leaders. Ooh, that was a great jump too. That was a great jump. Was so five meters. That was. I like how you're already starting to to mark. We're gonna have to have you out here. That was eighty six point five. So one okay. meter shy of Lars Burris. However, on the cumulative points, it looks like looks like Jasper took the lead over Lars. And this this is what makes it interesting because they've already done the race. So like you could literally go from like you said, Jasper tenth place finish into first with the jump. Yep. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Typically the mass start is known as more of a jumpers event because yeah. they can tend to hang draft behind some of the faster skiers longer, therefore kind of eliminating some of the time difference. Oh, for sure. Um, However, like I said, Taylor put on a show. I'm hoping we can figure out how to get that race back on one of these breaks between the men and the women's competition. So looks like we've got Florian Kolb of Austria. There was a real like kind of dogfight between the Americans and the Austrians during the race. So we had a couple people like Taylor and actually the, the guy who led the, the small hill for most of the race in Beijing uh, from Germany, Jakob uh, Lange. We're way out in front, but then there was this massive pack. It was like Austria, USA, Austria, Austria, USA, USA. And you can kind of see that unfold as we go back through the reverse order. Again, I think there's a bit of a scoring issue going on because Grant Andrews jumped, certainly didn't jump him above Jasper and Lars. So 
our timing folks, again, live competition are downstairs. They're from Switzerland. I might go down and knock on their door in a minute. Hey, sure they got hey, their this... algorithms correct. Shout out to Swiss timing though. Absolutely. <laughs> we got Jared Shoemate on the bar here. Um, you also met Jared, right? Uh, maybe. I think you went on a show, but maybe you might've been when you were competing. Oh, there's Tia. She just popped in again. Um, Jared Shoemate really broke out in Beijing. He had the second highest American finish. Uh, ben took 15th. Jared took 17th on the large hill. Mm -hmm. um, really like really hardworking guy. He literally was still a club athlete going to college, footing his own bills while working a full-time job and finally broke onto the national team. And the last couple of years, he's really just been able to focus. And so now he's becoming one of the best skiers in the world. It's awesome to see. So Jared took the lead handily. He's got about 10 points on Jasper now. Okay. So, so what are we, when we're talking about this, this, this run down the, the runway on the ice, what, what are we talking in terms of speed for the, for the men? So the speed, actually, if you, if you look at that live ticker, I sent you the speed for these athletes right now is averaging right around 88.2 kilometers an hour. So right around 50. Okay. And that's their I mean, that's takeoff. Pretty, that's they will, fast considering, yeah, they you know, will accelerate in these days as they start to gain vertical velocity. Yeah. So that's Florian Kalb. Uh, let's see here. No, sorry, that was Mark Louis Rayner, also of Austria. So he actually just slotted in right next to Jasper and Jared. They all went 86 and a half meters. Lars still has the longest jump, but again. He was at a bit of a deficit. Again, looking at this results page, ignore Grant. I'm not sure what's going on there. Yeah, because he went he went way, 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 way ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's kind of hanging out there. So I'm not sure what's going on with the calculations. Obviously, before the final results are done, everybody's got to sign off on it. Mm -hmm. Here's Ben. So Ben, theoretically, could have the longest jump. He seems to be jumping very consistently here. Ben, again, was our top finisher for team USA in Beijing at 15th. Um, but he's, he's a real, uh, competitor. There you go. Right Damn. past the 90 meter mark. Yeah. Wow. That's for sure. The longest jump by far. So Ben pretty much every time in his career, he's had a big goal or a big opportunity. He's managed to capitalize. So he has medaled at the youth Olympic games and the world junior championships. Okay. And he comes how, from, uh, how old is ben? What's that? How old is Ben? Ben is uh, 25, I believe. Okay, so still young in this sport. Still young in this sport for sure. And he's one of Jasper's uh, uh, fellow servicemen in the National Guard here in Utah. Oh, yeah. Yep. And then here's young Steven Schumann. He's the youngest of the athletes who went to Beijing, but also was able to finish in the top 25. Really strong way for him to start his Olympic career. So Steven had a great race today. I think... After after the race, he was in fifth or sixth. I can't remember, but he was right in that hunt for the for the the podium of the race part of this event. So, how, how long does a competitive season last post post Olympics? Usually, is it all all through to spring, pretty much? It is. Yeah, we our our season really year in year out runs from about Thanksgiving through end of March. Okay. Um, this year, you know, our last event, this is the first of a series. So we're going to go from here to Whistler, Canada to compete at the Olympic venue from 2010 and then on to Lake Placid, New York. Okay. So when, we might wait, wait, when's Lake Placid? what's that? When's Lake Placid? It's, uh, March 25th and 26th. Oh, okay. What are I'm you doing? Say, if, it was, if it was pushing to April, I might just come up. All right. Well, if you get a wild hair and decide anyways, I'll be there. Okay. We could do a lot. We could do a live, a live we broadcast could. from the booth. We could. So this is Thomas Rettinger Ret 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 from uh, from Austria. He's actually my son and his friend's favorite skier from Europe. He's a young kid who's really coming in strong. You can see how aggressive he was off the takeoff. Ooh, that's a ninety meter jump. That was definitely ninety. Thanks, Bob. Here's the link. I need the link. Oh, we got quite a few people watching. Oh, yeah. Nice.
What's cool too, actually, Devin, is I'm watching this on our website right now. So I put a player for FanFest on the usanordic.org website. It's pretty so cool. So this, is, this is just as as live as we're getting it, the people back home are getting it live. Yep. Nice. Here Got comes Manuel Einkemmer. Um, and I'm just sending Bob a message. So, try to see if we can so, pull in some the athletes as they finish. So it looked like Ben went to the lead with that last jump with his with his jump. He did for sure. Okay. And I don't think that uh, for the next couple athletes they're going to have the advantage unless they jump much further to pass Ben. But that's what makes the sport interesting is the the more it develops over time, the better the top athletes are at both disciplines. Like back, yeah. especially before my my uh, career. You'd have guys who were so fast, but they can never jump far enough to win. Or you guys who, had, who could jump so well, but they were never fast enough to stay ahead. And then in my era, you really had to be good at both. But now we have a few athletes that are really the best at both. And that makes it obviously very, very hard uh, mm -hmm. to balance those two disciplines. So yeah, it looks like Ben Loomis still has the longest jump at 91 and a half. However, yep, and he's still leading. Manuel Einkemmer that just jumped slotted in right behind him here comes our unless, top unless, unless the grant andrews score is correct then you know grant might be ahead he must have had a crazy windstorm if that happens that's about the only thing that would possibly explain that but i'm guessing that's a timing error so here comes our italian aaron costner he had a great race he finished fourth um actually third so we're really into the last three right now so aaron looks like It'll be interesting to see if he was able to to hold that gap that he had in the race over Ben Loomis. Mm -hmm. And waiting for the distance. Is there is there a big training hub for? I know like Steamboat Springs is like the hub, kind of Park City, you know, Lake Placid for the U.S. Is there a European training hub, or do they all have their own like, you know, little camps? They, so depends on the country, you know, a lot of countries don't have a whole lot of jumps at all, let alone mm -hmm. good facilities. So they tend to flock to the, the nations that do. So Germany, yeah. Austria, Norway really have a lot of venues, um, Italy, Slovenia, um, and some of the other countries like France have one or two or three good venues like the U S um, U S has a lot of clubs. Like we've talked about the 30, For but sure. we have three big ones in Lake Placid, Steamboat and Park City. So this is our second to last competitor Ooh. right now. This is Jakob Longa. So yes. in the Beijing games, he literally led most of the race. And then one of his teammates came from behind in the last kilometer. So if you haven't seen that, you might want to go back and watch it. But this is one of the top athletes in the world right here. My guess is that's going to be very close to probably, yep. So nice. that's David Mock. He just passed Ben Loomis. So he's the first athlete. And you can see now that they've adjusted Grant Andrews. So Grant fell back to 12th place after that adjustment. So David Mock of Germany. Now it's going to be Jakob Lange. So David Mock went the first. He did. Yep. So he, he edged out Ben Loomis with that time advantage that he had from the cross country. Hold on. <laughs> the taco truck down in the parking lot's calling me. I don't think that's going to work. I might have to silence my phone here. Um, mm. So Jakob, not happy with his jump. He was, like I said, one of the top athletes in Beijing, nearly won the gold medal. Yeah. But looks like he might have bobbled his takeoff a little bit on that one. Looks like he might have been a little bit late. Yeah, distance 78 meters. That's a major disappointment for him. So that puts Ben Loomis... In a second, I'll tell you, but I think officially on the podium. And here comes Taylor Fletcher for one of his last jumps. Of is, his it, this is the last competitor. Yep. Here we Come go. On, Come on. I'm locked in. I'm I'm uh invested now because I know Taylor. Taylor was absolutely amazing today in the cross country race. He skied just all by himself, skied away from everybody. So he's got about a seven meter advantage. Ooh, that's a good jump. 
It's a good jump. It's a yeah. good solid jump. And I believe that's enough to do it because he think, he had about 10, seven meters in hand over Jakob, who obviously did not. at least an 85 meter him. jump, right? Has to and be. he had about 10 meters on David Mock. So my guess is we're going to see him pop into the, to the victory spot here in a second. It looks like we have, oh man, live time has slowed down. Yeah. It hasn't, it hasn't updated yet. It's not really updating. Can... Taylor Fletcher says two beat 92 and a half. There you go. Taylor Ryan Fletcher. Is oh, mine, mine updated. Oh, he's, he's dominating 116 and a half points. He takes it easily. Five points to the good. All right. So is that, is it? So that's the, fi that's the final. Taylor that's Fletcher, David final, Mock, Ben Loomis. Yep, so the podium right now, Taylor Fletcher, David Mock of Germany, Ben Loomis of the USA, followed by a couple of the Austrians, Manuel Eichinger and Thomas Redinger. And then Jared Shoemate rounds out the fist podium, we call it top six uh, for Team USA. Nice. So, so gonna, oh, yeah. I, I got a quick question just because, you know, I'm interested in all this, and I'm sure that some of the fans that maybe are joining us that aren't in the, in the winter sports, you know, Nordic combined realm. What what are we looking at in terms of are we getting a, a trophy here? Are we getting prize money, bottles of champagne, some cheese? Like well, at this level, it's uh it's prize money to top six. World Cup it. goes top twenty for jumping or for Nordic combined and top thirty for jumping. Uh, but at this level it's top six. Um about fifteen hundred bucks to the winner on this on this tour. Um hey. better than nothing, right? Fifteen hundred bucks for a day's work, I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, I'll take yeah, it. we talked about that for a while that one night. Um, and then, you know, we've got actually some really cool, uh, pewter, pewter, uh, you know, like kind of vases and cups kind yeah. of in, uh, Nordic skiing history. Like the King's cup has always been this big pewter cup. And so we've been kind of following that lead here at, in park city, but every organizer gets to choose what they want to do for like an award. So sometimes you'll get something local, like a, like a wood, uh, dish or, like in Finland, it's usually like a birch wood dish. Um, other places will do something out of metal or glass. Um, so, I, I think when I do competitions, some of the coolest stuff, I, you know, obviously getting paid is is important because you know that's how we make a living. But you know, some of the cool trophies, like you said, we get like glasses of wine, big rolls of cheese. Yeah, you know, some some cool some interesting things that aren't really material value that we get to keep. You know, as like keepsakes are probably the coolest part of the of doing those competitions all over the world. Yeah. So I believe they've gone through and they've basically finalized the score. So we should see those pop up in a second. We'll run through the whole list. So we've got Taylor Fletcher in his retirement race, uh, taking the win. That's huge. I mean, I, I love to see a guy who's gone to four Olympic games, go out on top. Um, and David Mock of Germany again in second, Ben Loomis of the USA in third. You know, Ben is a second time Olympian, certainly somebody I think to watch for a medal in the future. A couple of the Austrian guys, Manuel Enkheimer and Tomas Redinger. And then obviously Jared Shoemate, one of our strongest athletes from Beijing, rounds out the top six. Jakob Langa, interestingly, fell down from his great race to finish in the seventh position. Mark Louis Rayner from Austria finished in eighth. Jasper Good of the US in ninth. And Lars Burris of Norway in tenth. So, you know, pretty uh, pretty eclectic uh, international field here for the end of the season. And really, obviously, Devin, I don't know what you're hearing, but we went from 10 or 12 teams to, to six really quickly in terms of nations, mostly because of the Ukraine conflict. Has that mm -hmm. been happening in track and field? Um, not specifically. The only the only thing is I, I wouldn't really be able to tell you because the last few competitions have only been U.S. based. Mm -hmm. um, we do have our World Indoor Championships next week. Right. And that's actually in Serbia. So I wouldn't be I would not be surprised if a few of the conflicting nations are maybe out of there or didn't make, you know, travel or whatever like that. So it's definitely been something interesting on, on sport in general and the, the whole, you know, everyone involved in the world in general. Yeah. So we're going to try one more time. to. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, this is interesting because I'm looking at the results. Right. And, you know, we talked about Jakob, um, you know, doing a great race. And so. It's interesting that this format is kind of flip flops so that you can see how, how important that jump really is. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, in my head, 10 meters isn't that big a deal or even seven meters, but that put them 
that put him, you know, pretty much out of the running by being five meters off of, yep. you know, an 85 meter jump or so. So very, very interesting that, you know, the jump, the jumps weight is, is almost more important or equally important to how fast you can ski. So like yeah. you said, that some of the best in the world right now probably have to be, you know, very, very fast and good jumpers in order to even compete or to compete and win. Absolutely. So um, we're getting, we're getting the highlights loaded up. We're going to see if we can actually catch the race. Bob, you want to bring somebody in from the chat? I saw Maxim Gleifko was hanging in there. Can we, can we just bring anybody from the chat? Is that, yeah, is that I, possible? That's my understanding. I don't know. I don't know how this works. I just show up and I'm and you know, I'm in. It's so funny. I'm like literally texting and, and radioing back and forth with the uh, with the production truck as we go here. This so again, guys, like you've got you've got live television, and the difference is when we did Olympic trials this year over Christmas, it was about a quarter million dollars for the TV show for that day for NBC. You know, um, this by by comparison, instead of seventy five people in two satellite trucks um, with miles of fiber optic cable, we're literally down to about six people which is a, a, a good size crew. I've done it with less. Yeah. Um, and uh, Bob, I think I saw Max's hand go up. Let's bring him in here. And actually, I'm going to mute myself once Max comes in and try to figure out when we're going to play these highlights. I know they're trying to get it up here for us. Oh, we got L Jones. Hey there. But it's, it's really fascinating when you get behind the scenes on sports. Devin and I pontificated a little bit about how to, how to, you know, put more money in athletes' pockets, how to create more value. And certainly events like this, you know, it's, it's easy just to do it for the athletic side, but it's important to try to bring in the partners and, and the prize money and, and really make it sustainable so that especially athletes from countries like America that don't have a lot of corporate sponsorship, don't have government funding, can have a viable future as they progress and, and support their training and their career. A hundred percent. I think it's really important too, just to, you know, bring sports, you know, to make the average viewer like myself, other than, you know, watching track and field and, and American football, you know, make it accessible um, because, you know, all this stuff is really interesting to me. And I just never really knew about it or knew, you know, how to keep score, what's important, you know, I'm just watching it to enjoy it. Um, and once you really learn, you get, you kind of get more engulfed in, totally. in, in the competition and, you know, knowing Taylor, you know, is a great cross country skier. So now we're like, okay, he just, he, he ran a great race, you know, he's, he's in the lead. All he has to do is jump a, you know, 82 to win. Right. And that's important as a fan, because, you know, if you don't know what's going on, really, you're just like, Oh, you know, what does that mean? How far did he jump? And then you just get the results at the end and you're like, okay, great. So yeah. it's cool to be behind the scenes um, for sure. And, and to kind of get the inside scoop, especially, especially talking to you because you know, everybody and, and everything that's going on. Yeah. So let's see here. Um, Bob, can you bring somebody in? I want to I wanna see what, how they're liking the show from home. Oh, we have a special guest coming in shortly. Okay. Is that, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, blow the surprise, but we've got, that's what's so cool about this is just being able to pull in anybody anywhere who happens to be awake. Hey, you know what? If I, if I need to, I'll call you Saint Bolt and get them on. Do get it. Them on the show. <laughs> You know what's well, all interesting? Right, all right. Out of 10, how many times do you take him in 100? Out of 10? Yeah. Right now, 10 out of 10. But, you know, obviously in his prime zero. There was actually an opportunity. This is funny. My first year pro in 2017, there was an opportunity for me to race in the 100 on in Usain Bolt's last, like, competition in Jamaica. And I had just raced the hurdles about 40 minutes before, and I decided to pass on it. Mm -hmm. Not saying that I would have beat Usain Bolt, but he only ran about 10, I think he ran like 10-1, 10-15, which is just around the wheelhouse of like what I can do in 100. So I'm just saying I could have possibly beat Usain Bolt in a race, but I missed my opportunity. So Look, I I'm only 12 seconds, like, you know, pro. So if I'm lucky. 12, see, here's the thing. 12 seconds is not, you know, no scrub any either. It, it feels, feels like I'm 
I'm going to kick myself in the back when I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm sure I couldn't do it now, but like I was, you know, super fit and stretched out. Like I could break, like I was like 12, two, 12, four, and it felt so fast. And then you're like, I would be like 30 meters behind you guys if we were a hundred, you know? Yeah. Which is crazy. And that's the funny thing too. Like, you know, there's some talk on Instagram and Twitter saying, Hey, we should just put a random person in every event just to compare. Just like, to show. Just to yeah. show. Like I would have been like Forrest Gump. You guys would have finished 30 meters ahead of me. I would have just kept going the same pace for the next 400 meters. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and people too, especially in my event, the, the hurdles, they're like, whenever I set up the hurdles, they're like, Oh, like, is that how high they are? And I was like, yeah. They're like, wow. I didn't, I never, you can't I tell on TV. Yeah. You know, like three foot, three foot oh. six is, is pretty high. Yeah. And I mean, like, you're probably one of the shorter guys. For uh, sure. For sure. Which is great, so, which, yeah. is, which is crazy to say, you know, being six one, but like most of the, most of the field is between six feet, six five. But right? still, it's like, you know, it's waist high to you probably, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. So, 100%. you know, it's like when you're looking at it on TV, it doesn't look super high, but you got to remember like the whole field six one to six five yeah or something it's crazy um i'm gonna actually i'm just gonna mute myself radio down here and see if i can get my boy nate on so hang on a second well you know hey everybody thanks for watching um i appreciate appreciate you guys being here um, if you're a nordic combined athlete or a fan glad you're here if you don't know anything about nordic combined um you're a little bit behind me because I've been learning about this event the last month, which is pretty great. And uh, I'm glad you're here as well. Oh, it's on. Oh, we got somebody. Oh, there he is. Hey, Kenny. Hello there. Thanks for joining, man. Of course. I'm calling from a side of the road motel at a girls soccer tournament. That's what's hey. happening over there. <laughs> no free shout outs, but shout out Super 8. Yeah, this one is not known for its Wi-Fi. I'm having a lot of emails kick back, but I'm on my phone holding it sideways. What are we doing? What's going on? Give me an update. So right now we are live at the uh, Ski Nordic Combined Continental Cup, Cup event in Park City, Utah. Damn right um, we are. They usually do the event with the ski jump first, take your distance, then they do a they kind of do a staggered start based on how far you jump. So the people that jump the furthest get a start first, and then people that jump least furthest start last. What they did for this event is they flopped it. So they did the sh a shotgun start where they started everybody at the same time, and then they ran from least least fast to fastest to jump. And, you know, whoever jumps the furthest and skis the fastest in theory wins. So Taylor Fletcher of the U.S. actually just finished his jump. Um, and he went out in front and he is the, what we would call gold medalist, first place finisher and, and the men's event. We're getting ready to do the women's jump as well. Um, that was say that again. So that was a comprehensive review. I just, I was really just making conversation, but you came heavy with lots of info. Oh, uh, I, hey, I, I'm Will, learning. I'm the Will learning Ferrell this. movie. There's a Will Ferrell movie on. Do we have the rights to show that? T We're not here nights. Okay. Um, shake, and, shake and bake. <laughs> Wait, our other guy just left. What happened? Why did he leave? So, so did you get, have you get, gotten the chance to talk to Billy yet? Uh, no, I just came on here. We got people texting us, tweeting us something. Um, I was asked, hey, can you join the show and just say anything? And that's, that's what I'm here for. I think a new event, modify this event. And I have another rule change also for golf. But what if like five jumpers just like a wider path and they all just go once and so actually we call it we call it rapid fire and everybody goes like yeah boom 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 boom. so they're in the air like following each oh, other amazing i would love to see that or five across go like five wide talladega we need talladega. a big old wide hill so yeah. kenny i'm billy i'm billy demong i don't think we've actually had the chance nice to meet to you, see you. thanks for joining thank you can i um, tell you my my rules changed for golf. I just made up the other day. No, go ahead. I think I can shave 15 strokes. So I want to be able to throw at any time, anytime I feel like it, basically. Like just, just one time. I no, no, no. Every hole if I feel like it. So play your regular, and it counts as a, as a stroke. 
but I'd I'd much prefer from seventy five in to throw, as opposed to using a nine or a wedge. Like because I'm never gonna hit the ball in the woods. I'm never gonna hit four feet. I'm always gonna be either on or come close to it. And I think it could revolutionize the sport. I know it's not what we're talking about tonight, but it just came to me to share that with you. I, I think mean, we're just the only way I'm ever going to be any better at golf is if I get to do something like that. So, I th- I think we're just making up making up stuff at the time. I I played golf actually today, and oh, nice. uh, and I, I'm with you because <laughs> it did not go well. And if I could throw you know, the ball, I would I would say probably about 50 strokes. Do you know that oftentimes guys, and I'm sure girls do it too, but um, we'll we'll make up a game. They just made it up. Literally two minutes ago, they just made it up. But then they'll argue while they're playing the as though these rules have been handed down for a century. Like, we did some really stupid stuff. Won't even tell you because we don't want to encourage the kids, uh, you know, like jackass-type material, right? Like, from that movie. Um, and then we would argue about, wait a minute, you can't step on the board by that, you know, like, whatever game you're... Yeah. Uh, we're just random thoughts right here. Free association. Let's take calls. <laughs> Who's tweeters? What do we got at the bottom? Somebody said something. Call, call, call it in. Yeah. Billy, what do we got going on again? We have a, we have the four athletes doing the, the test jump. Yep. So this is our last four jumper, I believe. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up the start list for the women's competition. So Kenny, I'm Billy DeMong. I'm the executive director for USA Nordic Sport, which is the, uh, the ski jumping and Nordic combined uh, mm-hmm. kind of Olympic association. Uh, Olympic gold medalist, by the way. How come I can't see anything? I just see mountains and you guys. Oh, you oh, don't yeah. see the actual competition happening right now? No, I feel cheated. Oh. That's weird. Here, re- re- refresh your screen. Yeah. Yeah, who knows how to do that? Hit that little circle arrow thing, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yep. Let's see what happens. All right, we've got bib number one, Estella Hasrick, climbing out onto oh, the bar yes. right now. Oh, Kenny dropped. I see, I see a familiar name in there. Yep. All right, folks, welcome back. We've got the women's first round. This is actually a fairly historic competition. Um, It's the first women's ski jumping FIS event since 2009 to be contested in the United States. And this is an up and coming junior national team member, Estella Hasrick. Um, She's from Minnesota. And it looks like she had a really solid first jump. I'm going to have to believe you because I still don't see it. But I love that she did that successfully. (laughs) Oh, that's no. crazy hey are most of we got, we got to send from, kenny a link from are they mostly from northern american areas northern and yeah. western i would say colorado well, it's utah pretty much just minnesota region. so it's like alaska what? to new hampshire okay jennifer so, Gen- Gen- oh sorry Gen- yeah jennifer her mom wisconsin. Just wisconsin. jennifer from oh, wisconsin jennifer's never gonna let me live that one down um uh, she's a she's a huge uh supporter of of usa nordic in terms of just her volunteerism is that is that mom um, what's that is that estella's mom yeah it was yep so now we've got macy olden coming down macy's from park city she's another junior national team member so so what's what's a good jump for the win like you know give me a kind of a a a distance for the women like what are we looking for the distances should actually be the same so the degree of difficulty here is actually the speed so you know the men's Field will usually start from a lower gate than the men's Nordic combined field. So the jumping specialists mm-hmm. and then the women's ski jumping athletes will be starting somewhere, maybe around the men's Nordic combined. What's really happening though, is like this, the gate where the speed is coming from is picked by the jury so that the best athletes will go close to that hundred meter line without getting hurt. And so realistically, if you see somebody going far short of that hundred meters or 90 meters, it just means that, you know, they're still trying to figure out to how to get the technique and power to get themselves down the hill. All right. Who do we got up next? Anna Hoffman. Oh, so Anna is one of our Beige. She was our Beijing Olympian for Team USA. Oh, that's a great jump for her. Ooh, that's an 80. Oh, that's so that's, that's in the yeah. jump at least. Absolutely. Is okay, there cash so I, money I get what you're saying. There? I get what you're saying there. So it wasn't really per se that, you know, so they're starting up at a different height now for the women. 
Yeah, it's well, and it's really it's 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 designed so that the best women will go about that same distance, like ninety to ninety five. Okay. So in, since since oh, yeah, I still don't have the video, which part of the mountain can I visualize where this is taking place? The, that top left part. Okay. And actually, so maybe- Kenny, um, we've got one of our former teammates joining us here in a minute. Um, this is Sam Masuga on the jump. But if you want, I'm gonna have Bob send you the uh, the the live stream link if you want to see what's I love going it. on. You have a professional join. I'm glad I got to join. Glad I got to meet you. Good luck to the athletes. Anybody from the state of Washington involved? Not today, but I'd love to get the club in Leavenworth going again. Hey, okay. I used to go to school in Wenatchee, and the ski school is up there at Leavenworth. Hey, Kenny, Kenny, before you before you head off, we got one of the fans in the chat says that we need to head out to Park City, and me and you are going to compete in ski jumping. Let's do it. Also, Mission Ridge, right? Mission Ridge out that way. I think that was the other one. And uh, all right, all right. You guys be well. Nice seeing you, Kenny. Thanks for thanks for being on. You got it. Later. So Sam Masuga looks like she's throw down a nice, uh, nice ride. Actually, it looks like that last jumper was Natalie Eilers of Canada. Natalie looks like she went 72 and a half. So Anna's still holding a huge lead, obviously, Devin. Yeah. Well, you know? I mean, and that jump was, you could, I mean, you know, I don't know how well the, the other girls usually jump, but obviously this is my, was... this is, this is one of the crowd favorites, Josie Johnson. She, Josie Johnson. She's, JJ. Uh, I believe 15 uh, just competed in her first junior world championships was the top American. Uh, but she, she's certainly not a, a really tall 15. Ooh, okay. That's a great jump. Yeah. 70, about 77 meters. I think so. You're pretty good so. at this. We would have to hire you for the video measuring crew here. Yeah. Well, you can to see- be honest, that line is very, very, very distinguishable. Yeah. You can see she's about as tall as that bike barricade. Yeah. You know, I, I'm interested too. If you you know most of the the American athletes, quick rundown where everybody's from. We we know we know Estella's from Wisconsin, but yep. I mean not yeah. What about Macy, Josie, and yep. so, Anna? So Anna is from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, um, and then and we have Macy and Josie are both from Park City. Okay. And here we have Logan Sankey from the Steamboat. Hey, shout out Logan. Sports. I know Logan. She was she was one of the first we had on the show. Hmm. My so guess is Logan is about to have a, a really good jump. She's been training really well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So she's going to be right in there with Anna, right around that 82. Probably 83, 84 meter jump there. Yeah, she's pretty good. I think, let's see here. It looks like she's she's likely taking over the lead right now. So, yep. so I know Logan went over to Europe. So they had a few competitions and then they made a quick trip back to the U.S. Yep. So they're going to finish this series out. So again, this weekend here in Utah, next weekend in Vista, Canada, and then I'm going to be popping over to uh, Lake Placid for the finale this year. So Logan did take over the lead. She's four points ahead of Anna. Um, And now we have Kara Larson jumping on the bar. So So Kara, she's from Chicago, Illinois, believe it or not. Shout out Chi-Town. And, uh, What's interesting is the the Norgi Ski Club, which was is about an hour on the North Metro line, uh, north of the city, has put out more of our Olympic ski jumpers in the last two Olympics than any other club in America, and actually in all of them combined, believe it or not. Really, so wow. really strong, healthy club right there in Chicago. The tallest thing for a hundred miles is probably the top of that ski jump, and looks like. Or the Sarah, Sarah. All right, Kara. Kara moves into fourth place, right behind Josie. Again, like what's interesting again with the you know sort of the year end travel this year, um, in the Ukraine situation is this went from like eight or nine nations to four, I believe, really quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but because we had that many nations on the entry a week and a half ago, they were able to just say, "Go ahead and have the competition," which. You know, with COVID, Devin, I'm, I'm sure you've been through a lot of stuff. It's like, it's really hard because things are getting canceled. It's like trying to just make it work. All right, um, here we have our Swedish uh, athlete. The sole Swede here is Astrid Norsted. She is um, really leading the Swedish team as they try to, you know, it's odd because. Ooh, it's good jump. Ooh, so she had a little bobble on the landing. Potentially the judges might look at that as a touch, which is a huge deduction on style. 
style doesn't normally play a role, but when, when you actually touch the ground in any way, one hand or all the way down, it mm -hmm. takes a huge toll. But, but what I was going to say is Nordic skiing, you know, you think all the Nordic countries would be really good at all the Nordic disciplines, but honestly, Sweden has been a phenomenal cross country nation, but they really have not been successful in Nordic combined and ski jumping. So she's kind of a pioneer for her country. Mm -hmm. And here comes Sam Masuga. I must've seen a wrong graphic earlier, but Sam is another park city athlete. Um, she's been a huge spokesperson for USC Nordic and women's ski jumping these last few years. Um, so it, it she's really stepped up uh over the last two years and this i think is her fourth year on the national team so when we're talking about the wind gauge the negative wind means wind in their face is some negative points means they're getting headwind so, so that's it's, a good it's thing like, usually. what's that it's a good thing usually it's a good thing but they try to you know kind of even out the field by taking a few points away and it's actually pretty scientific they're they're measuring the wind at nine points on the hill right now real time and so mm -hmm. as they fly through the zone where the anemometer is, they're calculating how much, um, you know, benefit or penalty they're receiving and then trying to factor that in. Okay. It's a, it's not a perfect science, but it's certainly a lot, it's a lot better than it was when, yeah. you know, it was nothing but flags and coaches like, oh, it looks safe, go, you know? Yeah. We, we try to do that in track and field sometimes, not officially like on the, on the marks because we, all the racers run at the same time. Right. But, you know, we, we like to say, oh, that was a 2.0 tailwind, you know, that could, you know, that's, if it's at 0.0, .0 that's, you know, two tenths slower or a tenth slower usually. Yep. And here comes Nina Lucy. So Nina is the veteran of the team. That's a good jump. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Nina is from Lake Placid, New York. Um, she, actually, for sure. she and I have the same birthday. She's uh, about 10 years younger than me. And honestly, we're the same size. So a lot of her equipment as you was growing up was coming from me. Suits, skis, the whole deal. That's great. But custom suit, right? You're in the, you're in the suit room right now. I am how in the long, suit room. How long does it take to make a suit from start to finish? Somebody who's good at making one, 35 minutes. Oh. That's like from, so you can see wow. the paper hanging on the wall over there. Yep. So those are templates. And so... You know, the, the coaches measure the athletes. They work with the athletes to make those templates. Then they cut the material off the rolls and they end up with, I guess, that side over that way. Yeah. The finished product. Um, what do we got here? It uh, looks like we got Paige Jones. So Paige is one of our top women's athletes. She was our best athlete last year at the World Championships. But then Ooh. she ended up um, having a severe knee injury at uh, a competition here in the u.s right after so she, this is her kind of like her real comeback and she's she's been incredible watching her um just build her own motivation and get super excited um to that was a great job back after it it's gonna be tight here though so nina took over the lead for sure ahead of logan and anna and we're waiting for the score from Paige to come in This is Annika Belshaw. I believe she was on World's Greatest. Devin, I'm not sure if you were there. She was on with her brother, I believe. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, I was. I was on that show. Yep. They're they're uh, they're not twins, are they? No. There's actually two sets of siblings on the team, brother and sister. Both the sisters are named Annika. So it was either Annika Malasinski or Annika Belshaw, but I believe both of them made the show. Annika is one of the most tenacious competitors I've ever met. She recently podiumed in a fist cup competition. I think it was two weekends ago in Europe, in Germany. But so she, she's I'm one of our little bit of a, I'm seeing a little bit of like a right fade. Is that, is that due to the wind? You Likely, think? yeah. It, okay, it's either probably the track is tilted to one side a little bit or the wind is blowing down and from the left. Although I can see the flags out the window and it doesn't look like much is moving. Okay. So, you know, because we're kind of doing this in a non-traditional format, we should talk about some of the, the more detailed things. When we showed up today, the sun had been beating on the track all afternoon, and we actually had to recut that track at the mm -hmm. last minute. So, you know, the, the team got out there with a bunch of buckets full of uh, like a slurry of ice. Mm -hmm. And then right as it started to get back down to freezing temperatures, 
um, redid that entire track they're now coming down. So this is Karina Voigt of Germany. That she, so it's interesting. She's one of our better uh, athletes on, on, at this event. However, if you watch this replay, she basically missed the takeoff, you know, you'll see she, her feet kind of come down. So it means she's really late. Oh yeah. Come up and she gets no effect. Yeah. So that timing is super important. That's it what, you know, you know, it was crazy. And initially before I knew a lot about the sport, I thought the, the, the ramp kind of went like this. It, it's flat. It's actually negative 11 degrees. Yeah. So like you have, you live, you legitimately have to jump. Yeah. If you don't it's, jump, you will not go anywhere. You have to like literally jump off of that to exactly. get out. Of the yeah. All right, so now we have Josephine Lau of Germany as well. She's our last competitor, but right now we still have three Americans in first, second, and third with Nina Lucy, Paige Jones, and Logan Sankey. That was like a good jump. Yep. That was solid. Good jump. My, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say I think that's going to put her right in the middle of the Americans who are now currently first through sixth. Oh, she moves into six. So she bumps Josie Johnson, but we have five Americans in front of her still. So that's a really strong first round. My guess, though, you asked about distance. The jury will likely move the gate up quite a bit for the next round because they're really going to want to see some of these women go 95 meters. Um, so I think they were being a bit conservative, and it's really hard once you start a round to move the gate. You know, it's not very wait, what do you, wait, wait, what do you mean next round? There's two, they, get two, they get two attempts? Yep. So, so in Nordic combined, they get one jump in the race. In ski jumping, they have two rounds of jumping. Oh, so so we're going straight ski jumping now. Yep. So this is okay. straight. Yeah. I thought I thought we were still. I thought we were Nordic combined still. I was like, oh. No. No, we're gonna do our. So this is the women's ski jumping Continental Cup field. Um. Yeah. And again, you can see now Nina Lucy leading ahead of Paige Jones, Logan Sankey. Annika Belshaw, Anna Hoffman for Team America there up front. The lone or the the one of the Germans, Josephine Lau, is in sixth ahead of Josie Johnson and the Swedish uh, competitor, Ostrid Norstead. And then Kara Larson, Samantha Masuga uh, round out the top 10. Um, so as we go back into the next round, we're gonna get we're gonna do this in reverse order. So Macy Oldham will go first and Nina Lucy will go last. Looks like we got Grant Andrews. How's it going, guys? What's going on, Grant? Thanks for joining, man. Have you yeah. guys met before? Just got back from the competition. No. Sorry? Have you have you met Devin before? Uh yeah, we briefly met uh when I was in Lillehammer, actually. Yeah. Oh wait, no, we didn't. We were not on the same interview. Um or uh live stream together. Um, but I watched it and uh you were commenting on what we did previously. Nice. What's up? What's up, brother? Are you, it's good uh, to see you guys. Are you, are you uh, in a competition area right now? Are you just kind of off for the season? No, uh, no. I just competed. No. Um, Remember just Grant? now. I, I just got home after competing. Oh, sh oh, this is this is the Grant. This yeah. is the Grant that we just watched this about is the Grant. Minutes oh, ago. Let's go. How's it going? Pretty good. Well, I mean, actually, not that great. It was not a very good competition for me. Sorry, I'm on my phone, so this is. No, uh, good. Uh, yeah. he's popping out. No, but Grant, this is cool. I mean, so, you know, we're trying stuff out. Obviously, thanks for, for running home and joining us. Um, you know, what do you think about today? Like, tell us a little bit about the competition, but then, you know, let's dive into some other stuff. Oh, actually. Yeah, sure. Um, well, great. Sweet. Um, I soldier hall. I have raced since I was back in 2018. Grant, we're we're losing you, dude. We might have to kick you out. All right. Can you hear go. me? Or no? Yeah, uh, you're breaking up a lot, but we got the race. We we were we just got the highlights to to pop in here. So you can watch watch it with us. Yeah, watch okay. it with us. All right. So here yeah. we go. So, folks, this is what happened before the jumping. So, mass start race. You can see everybody gets to go on the gun. Um, 
10 kilometers. And this race actually has about um, 1,200 feet of vertical gain and descent in it. So there's four 2.5 kilometer laps. Each lap, they're gaining like about 300 vertical feet over the course of the lap. There's a few different climbs. And you can see on the first lap here, the group kind of stayed together. But if it's single file like that, it means the pace is high. And yep. as, they, as they start to separate, I was actually announcing this live um, for the stadium. This first lap, it already started to split apart. You can see Taylor Fletcher on the right, and you can see Jakob Longa on the left as they started to separate themselves. And then this is that giant chase pack we talked about during the jumping with a lot of the American and Austrian skiers. Um, I know it, it's hard to tell on TV, but a lot of those climbs are actually really steep. We're talking like 20 degrees, you know, like a flight of stairs or even steeper. Yeah. And, you know, this grinder right here is several hundred meters long. And you can see Taylor already starting to throw the hammer down on the third lap and starting to really open up a time uh, gap over the second place, which was Jakob Lange. A couple of the Americans here. And this was really the chase group for most of the race. We have David Mock of Germany, Aaron Costner of Italy, and I believe that was Thomas Redinger of Austria. And then this is Taylor obviously powering his way to the victory here at the finish yeah. line. Nobody else in sight. I think the net time gap was about 30 seconds to second place. Ooh. You can see him just now coming over the bridge at the Olympic Stadium down in Soldier Hollow. And then Jakob Longa finishing second, uh, 30 seconds behind Taylor Fletcher, who's still uh, chilling on the ground. What was that? What was that drink that they gave him? Like a giant beer? That was a 40. Yeah. 40. Uh, he had a couple of his friends come down to celebrate his retirement. Um, yeah, it was really spread out. And a lot of it, Devin, I mean, racing when it's warm enough to be like in beach clothes, which it was today is awful. You know, when you're going that hard, that long, and you're also coming out of the winter where you're used to being like cold. really, uh, really cold the whole year. And by the way, Devin, we've got Sarah Hendrickson who jumped in just now. So Sarah, uh, Sarah, thanks for joining. Sarah's one of my board members and uh, former teammates. Um, she's now uh, retired as well. She's the 2013 world champion in, in ski jumping. Um, Sarah, Devin Allen is America's best, uh, high hurdler right now. He got fourth in Tokyo and, uh, you know, it's sort of his off season, but sort of his on season, he's been crushing it at indoor. Um, and, uh, he has been helping us host a lot of these sort of innovative new webcasts. And tonight's our first try at live streaming an event at the same time as, you know, kind of having a little talk show. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, that's awesome. Nice to meet you, Devin. Nice to meet you too, Sarah. So, um, Sarah, we've probably got it, I think, by my clock, by my name, to in a second and see when exactly second round supposed to start. Um, I think we're going to be uh, showing the podium ceremony for men's Nordic combine here in between rounds, um, but then really going into women's second round, which Sarah, I don't know if you were watching um, or if you saw the live ticker, but Team USA obviously off to a good start with five in the top five. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, fun to see a bunch of names. And um, yeah, I've watched all these girls from when they started ski jumping. So it's, it's fun to have a Continental Cup in Park City. I never got to compete in an international competition in Park City. So um, I'm really glad they have the opportunity to do so. Yeah, I mean, Sarah, we were talking about it, like the attrition of the teams lately, you know, just I think year end budgets and obviously with Ukraine and travel, um, it was disappointing to drop down to so few. But on the flip side, you know, this is the first event that we've had since 2009, which I'm pretty sure you compete in that Continental Cup. So hoping that we can make this, you know, a staple on the schedule from here on out. And obviously, pretty cool to have six in a row here in North America. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's definitely just going to be um, a good staple at the end of the season for um, a lot of the athletes. And I know everyone wants to travel to the U.S. So I think next year, um, keeping in mind that maybe the world will be in a little bit better place, um, more countries will be able to come over and um, it'll just be a little bit more open. But we got to start somewhere. So um, we're happy that I think that we can still have this event happen in Park City. Yeah, absolutely. 
So, um, Sarah, what I, one of the things we've done during this is, you know, we brought in a lot of different athletes and um, I'll get confirmation from Bob if there's anybody else who will join us. But what I found fascinating, especially, um, um, sorry, I saw a text fly by my screen. What I found really interesting talking to Devin, especially in some of the women that have been at the world championship level um, in sprint and hurdles is just how much of a mental game it is. You know, I think we obviously totally get that from ski jumping and I get it even from cross country, but even cross country is less. I think, I think for a lot of degrees, it's more about, you know, getting out there and just making it hurt and then making a few good calls. Um, but it seems to me like what was amazing is just, you know, how mental a sprint was, you know what I mean? So I don't know, Devin, you want to, you want to kind of chat to Sarah for a second while I go check in with the competition staff and just make sure I know when we're going to be starting our second round. Yeah, for sure. I think it's interesting to me too, the, uh, you know, in the hurdles and the sprints, I always say when I run a good race, I almost black out, um, from the gun. Right. But I just found out from Billy today that the gate, you know, the starting gate moves up and down depending on, you know, what you practice and all that stuff. So I can't imagine you can do that. You can't really black out. You have to focus all the way to the takeoff because, you know, it's going to be a little bit different timing every time you compete. So that's pretty interesting, just how much focus, um, you know, kind of needs to happen, um, especially at a, at a World Cup event like this, um, where, you know, some prize money's on the line, you know, some prize on the line as well. Um, and it seems, my question is like, on average, what, you know, do you, do, do the athletes usually jump farther the second, the second time around or usually the first time? Cause I know like sometimes in my events, you know, a second race isn't always better, you know? Yeah. So what do you, what do you think? I think, I think your sport's a little bit more like physically demanding. So I think like you said, you have more races and you're going to run out of energy and you know, ski jumping is physically demanding in the, in the types of training we do. But in a ski jump, I wouldn't say we expel like a ton of energy. So um, it's really dependent on the athlete if they have a better um, first round or a second round. Um, it just kind of depends on the athlete because it's just such a technical sport, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So okay. it's really all over the place. Okay. And so, and, and usually... When you're looking to jump, you know, we got a couple um, athletes in this event today, over 80 meters. Um, you know, how often, like, I'm sure you're pretty consistent throughout the season, but I know the track kind of stays, you know, changes based on, you know, how far you jump from and, and kind of that, uh, you know, arc towards the bottom of the hill. I forgot what Billy called it. Um, how often are you guys um, going over 90 meters? Like, you know, you personally, um, and maybe some of these athletes coming up. Yeah. Um, often, very often that's the, we call it the K point, the critical point. Mm -hmm. And, um, so that's like the goal of where you want to land on the hill. So I would say if we could get, um, maybe the gate to go up a little bit on this hill, it could help them jump a little bit over that 85 meter mark, which is what they were on the first round. So, mm -hmm. um, I know there's, a little bit of tailwind so that can be difficult but uh yeah i would say just giving a little more speed can help them get to the bottom of the hill and what is is there a world record in this in this event um it, it kind of seems hard to have an official record because um you know the, the tracks change but is there like a like if you jump this distance you're like the you're like the girl or the guy in this event yeah, so we have what we call hill records. So each each different hill, um, each ski jump around the world has a different hill record, and technically it has to be set in a World Cup event. But um, all the while, it, it's still like um, documented in the results or whatever, like whatever the hill record is for for this location. In terms of world record, um, there's a world record which is the longest ski jump ever, and that's um, on a ski flying hill, and it's over 250 meters. So the hill record on this hill, um, I would have to go check the, uh, the uh, archives on that, but I think it's about 103 meters or something like that. So it's, it's pretty far. Okay. Do you expect any of the athletes to do that today? No, I don't think so. Um, it's, okay. it's pretty hard to, uh, 
to to go over 100 meters on this hill but um like i said i'm not sure what gate they're going from so hopefully we can get a little bit more speed this next round and hopefully bring them down to about 90 meters okay great 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 looks like it looks like we're oh hey hi hi bill sent me in to say hello oh what's up <laughs> in... i'm barry nan i'm one of the uh race secretaries for the weekend Glad and you're here. a parent of a development athlete so great so yeah, how's it going Sarah, I, I have a question too because you know you competed um at a high level and i always ask the athletes that i i like to interview we interview in the show what is one yeah. of your favorite places to compete for one just competition wise and two one of your favorite places to travel because i'm sure you've traveled um quite a bit yeah um well i mean i'm a little biased because i won world championships in italy and uh, we had an italian coach at the time and he was born and raised in this in this little town in the dolomites and um, we competed in a world cup there the year prior to world championships and it was just like an amazing atmosphere i really loved the jump and we we train there is kind of like our second home. Um, so I love it there. And then also favorite place to travel would probably be Norway. Um, just a really cool place. We also go to Japan a lot, or I used to go to Japan a lot, which is just very different and um, nice to embrace a different culture. Are you, are you doing these trips in the summer or in the winter? So is there snow or no snow? Both. Um, oh, okay. So both summer and winter, there's competitions um, summer and winter, we have um, artificial, uh, we have plastic that we jump on, on the ski jumps. So um, like the green fingers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, we jump year round, which is what's so crazy. Grant, Grant's back. Hey, I'm back. I figured it out. Amazing, hey, Grant. Grant. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Barry now. Hey. Looks like we got, a, looks like we got a little podium ceremony. I'm not sure. Yep, that's uh, Jared wow. Shoemate. He got sixth place today. Okay, nice. so so Billy Billy said this, and he called. I don't know what he called the podium, but he said the top six is called a something podium. Is oh, that, I don't know the term actually. Surprisingly, yeah, I don't know that term either. They do like uh, top six at Continental Cups, and then they also do it at like World Championship events. So, okay, but I don't know the yeah. proper term. Interesting for a Continental Cup top six gets uh, money for our sport, at least. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of what you're shooting for. I mean, obviously you want to win, but. <laughs> what, are, what are we talking, what are we talking money wise here? Like six places going out with 50 K. Oh no, not even close <laughs> to that. Like uh, for a common 50. cup, it's a very small number. $50 um, maybe. 50 Sorry. Bucks. No, well, no, Billy said first place is 1500. So I can imagine maybe six places like 500 200 250 yeah somewhere around there maybe like 150 200 depend um i'm not entirely sh uh sure on the numbers but around there yeah okay that's hey but that's why that's what the that's what the fans want to know they're, they're yeah. we're talking dollar bills out here wait it's really it's really not that much for us <laughs> unfortunately but uh that's the way our sport is so yeah, um world we're cup is much more yeah i mean and and to be honest too there's there's quite there's a few big events for the for track and field but you know we're kind of in the same realm where you know totally. if you if you win you can make a good living but if you're not really you know then it's that's just kind of how it is you know yeah so. world cup's different because you get paid out to 20th place okay nice if you guys were wondering what the time delay to the screen is i just told adam schwal when to tell everybody to go out Oh, nice. Or below where I am right now. Taylor Fletcher. That's there you go. I know, him. I know that guy. Yeah. So, so, uh, so Grant, while we have you on, um, you know, thanks for thanks for coming. Um, yeah. Chat a little bit about your competition today. I know you know it's not quite the the finish you wanted, but um, you know I always like to to get the athletes' mindsets and kind of their you know. I, when, when I coach athletes, I actually coach track athletes at the college level. I say, hey, you know, don't be hard on yourself post-competition. Be critical and, that, you know, talk about, like, what you can improve on, the good things, you know, you did today, the, the bad things. So kind of yeah. give me a rundown. You know, your jump was over 80 meters. What do you what do you usually jump in, you know, on, on a track like this today? Like, what was your goal and in terms of, you know, what could be better, what could be, you know, kind of cleaned up? Um, 
so the track today was actually difficult, which is surprising. That doesn't really happen. Um, the temperatures were kind of making it hard on the, the jump. And so the like, track was like sticky right at the takeoff. Yeah. You can kind of see down at there at the bottom. Um, it was soft and sticky. So I'm hoping to go like 95 meters plus normally. Uh, and I've done it in the past, so it's not something like it's out of the picture. Mm -hmm. um, but technically today for me, I just like I had a decent jump, but stuck a little bit on the table. And because of that, like my flight just kind of went like this and I had mm -hmm. no support underneath me to like help me build and go further. So I was just only carrying speed. Um, so I wasn't entirely happy with my jump, but sometimes that happens. So that's interesting, Grant. Just because um, honestly, I I was watching and I was wondering why so many people seemed like they were kind of hanging. But it makes a lot of sense if it's like slowing down on the table. It's like the worst feeling. Yeah. So either so well, some people like my first jump. If you are like really prepared for that uh speed change sometimes you'll shift your butt too low and you'll be too far behind and you'll like kind of we call it booting a field goal and just like mm -hmm. come too high and uh you'll gain a lot of height but you won't go very far if you're not carrying yeah. enough speed um and so that's what i did on my trial round <laughs> and then in my comp round i was like okay the track's got to be better and i pushed like i was in balance and pushed down and stuck so I was just, I mean, this is really technical, but I was ahead of the speed. And um, so like my feet kind of went too far behind me and I just, my skis didn't support me. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to explain in lame terms, but. No, I mean, but that's, I think that's interesting. And, and for me, you know, not knowing much about the sport other than what I see, um, you know, it's, it gives me a lot of insight just on, you know, what's going through through your mind as an elite athlete and kind of how, you know, things can change from comp to comp and even from trial run to the actual jump, you know, in competition, yeah. right? Because, like, you feel like a trial run should be, you know, like, okay, I, I got it down. But like you said, the track changed between the trial run and the final, right? So yep. you, you, you even have to kind of keep your head in a swivel and, and kind of adjust, adjust, you know, at that time too. So that's very interesting. So thanks for thanks for giving that insight. Yeah. I mean, normally you try to just like, uh, you try not to change anything. You try to do it the same every time, mm -hmm. but it doesn't always work out that way. Well, that's what I was just talking to Sarah about in my event. It's pretty much the same every time, right? You know, the distance is always the same. You know, only thing that changes is, is the weather. Um, but, um, it seems like you guys adjust the track height, the distance you guys are flying some of like the, the apex point, you know, on the hill is different on every on every hill as well. So that's pretty interesting that like so many things can change and so many variables can change, um, you know, just from track to track and from first trial round to next trial round, which is which is something I never thought about because I just assume that every track is the same. Everything's the same, you know, all the time. Right. Yeah. The, uh, Grant, I think we're getting ready to go here on the second round for women's jumping. Yeah. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna ask you to 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 take off and Sarah. Sure. I'd like to yeah, it was good to say hi before we. Uh, no, dude, it's awesome. I think it's so cool that you were able to compete and then show up here and and share some some of what's going on that even I can't really see from what I'm watching. You know. Yeah, yeah it's so, hard to see. It's a lot of feeling. So. All right, buddy. All right. Well, good luck tomorrow. Thanks, we'll see you after the comp. Thanks. Okay. Alrighty. Now. So Sarah, I'm gonna have to dive and plug in uh, my hotspot here. Um, but, uh, one of the things that I was trying to explain to Devin is, you know, that first round on women's jumping, everybody's like, well, how far should the women be going? And it's like, well, the same. So, you know, I feel like the jury was a little bit conservative with the gate on that first round. Um, hoping, you know, I think obviously we have a pretty good field here that they'll, they'll give them a little speed to run. You want me to go give, get Keith, uh, Hanson in here and you can talk him up. Oh, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, I can hear. Um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, maybe it's a, there's a little bit of tailwind out there or something, but I feel like uh, maybe a little bit more speed would be nice. I know these girls can handle it 
easily. So um, I was talking with Devin about, uh, you know, what we're expecting for some distances in the second round. And, um, you know, hopefully they pump the gate up a little bit, get a little bit more takeoff speed and see those girls around 90 meters have mm -hmm. a little bit. Hey, more speed. More, more speed is always good. Yes, exactly. More speed and headwind. Yeah, so Devin, so I know you guys hate headwind in your sport, but what's amazing. Actually, that's, you know, that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, statement there because for the best hurdlers, we prefer a slight headwind because um, towards the end of our race, you know, hurdles five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, um, we tend to run up on the hurdles. You know, we're running so fast that we're getting too close. And so if we have a little bit of a headwind, we can just be real aggressive. You know, but if we have a tailwind, we kind of have to like back off and chop a little bit um, or we're going to run, you know, just kind of flop into the next hurdle. So it, it is interesting. Like usually a tailwind is, is best, right, for just the overall time. But some of the best hurdlers in the world, some of the elite guys will, will definitely benefit um, with a with a headwind. A, not, not a huge headwind, but like a slight headwind is always uh, pretty good, especially if it's a slight headwind in warm weather. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so, fascinating. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's super interesting to hear. And, and, and two, if you like, you know, you can watch some events. You know, we got uh, Grant Holloway, who's the 60 meter uh, indoor world record holder. And, you know, he's the second fastest in, in history of the, the 110s outdoors. Um, you know, he's probably one of the examples of just running up on the hurdles too quickly. Yeah. Right. So it seems that he's one of those guys that definitely would benefit from a, a headwind in a race. And, and, you know, same with me towards the end of the race, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of running up on the hurdles and flying. So definitely interesting take. And I think, you know, like you said, a lot of people don't, wouldn't know that obviously a tailwind is going to help you run faster, but yeah, you know, you, hey. if you hit the hurdle and fall, it doesn't matter. So we got our first competitor, Macy Olden from Park City on the bar here. Sarah, did you ever coach this youngster? Oh, yeah. I had Macy um, in a couple years of Fly Kids, um, which is our development uh, camp every uh, every summer. So I've gotten to know, know her quite a bit in the recent years, but I also remember when she was jumping on the 10 meter and um, – yeah, she's grown a ton, uh, just really great girl and super hard worker. So it's super fun to watch her in Continental Cup now. I know she's one of my son's favorites, Liam. <laughs> he was like, I, I really hope Macy jumps well tonight. So he's out there marking with uh, a bunch of, of the kids that you know, Seth uh, Rothschild and Augie Repke, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, you I said, love it. I mean, Macy's, that's... Macy's one of the younger athletes, right? Yeah, she's our, I think, our first year on the junior national team. So she's probably about 16, maybe even 15. I can't remember if I've seen her drive or not. Sarah, <laughs> you know? Um, I don't remember if she's driving or not either. I mean, I feel like you meet someone as a, as a kid and you're just there forever eight years old in your head and you forget that they're getting older as well as you. Totally. So this is Karina Voigt. Ooh, there we go. Devin, on her first jump, she just missed the takeoff. Like we saw yeah. her feet under her. That, she that was went much better. Yep. Yeah. That's a good 80 meter jump. 59 and a half to 80. So again, I mean, I think you know it from hurdles, but you know, timing is everything. And obviously it's magnified at this speed. So hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. Definitely a better looking jump for her. So I hope she's enjoying your time out in Park City. I'm not sure if she's been here before. I think it's probably her first time. So. Hopefully she's Great. enjoying herself. Yeah, and it's so interesting too with that like timing aspect of the ski jumping because when we watch it on TV, you can't really tell, you know, the slopes and the degrees of the hill and all that stuff. But, you know, Billy, you know, informed me just, you know, about 30 minutes ago that the, you know, the slope is actually at a negative angle. Like, so you're not, yep. you're not really getting, you're not getting thrown off like a, like a, a ramp. You actually have to jump right. in order to go. Right. Yep, that's exactly where the jumping comes from and ski jumping. So, yeah, it hangs out about negative 10 degrees. So that's why we do a lot of our physical training to maximize that um, power efficiency to get from the takeoff into our flight position by creating the most height while maintaining speed, as Grant was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. So that was Estella Hasrick, 63 on the first jump. Looks about the same on the second jump, but I think overall she's had a lot of, of – uh, 
really upward trend this year. So pretty cool to see her. She's from Wisconsin, right, Jen? Her mom popped in to tell me I, she wasn't from Minnesota last last round. So yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah, so right. that's a great one. Yeah, and then we this is our uh, Canadian athlete Natalie Eilers. It was nice that she was able to make it down because it was touch and go if, if she was going to make it back from Europe in time. Yeah, no, it's great to see her. She's made so many improvements over the past couple of years. Um, I jumped with her a little bit before I retired, and it's just so amazing to see the Canadian team and how much they've um, grown and developed in a country that doesn't really have working ski jumps full time. So um, it's always a pleasure when they come to Park City to train, and I know we use them a lot over in, in Europe to work together as Team North America. I'm actually so Sarah. Does it strike you that their skis are hanging like tailwind? I'm I'm trying yeah. to pull up the points right now to see if I can figure out what's going on. Yeah, first round there was tailwind, like almost a meter per second of tailwind. So, um, you know, night comp in Park City that isn't too um, unique. I the wind flags look pretty calm, but it's still. I mean, jumping at Park City, it's super high elevation, so the air is thin anyway, and then just that little bit of tailwind can be pretty tough. So. Um, you know, working with what you got and, and it can definitely throw you off with that timing of the takeoff. Yeah. And I mean, so this is Sam Asuga. Um, I'm kind of wondering if it's actually a little bit of a downdraft, you know, kind of that nighttime, like the airs, the cold air starting to settle down into the valley like it normally does. Because I'm, I'm looking out the window and yeah, the flags are pretty dead, but they're moving around. I'm wondering if there's more than the anemometers are actually factoring in. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I saw someone in the chat just asked, um, is it harder to jump at night than during the day? And I mean, we have lights that um, illuminate the whole hill, but I always struggled with jumping at night just a little bit more. I actually ended up getting contacts in my last few years as a as a competitor because I was just like really struggling with the, the nighttime variability. And so, you know, I prefer jumping during the day, but um, theoretically those lights should... Um, light up the hill um, in a consistent manner so it shouldn't be too big of a difference but um, athlete dependent I guess that's who is that Kara Larson yep that was Kara yep she's had a great season as well I feel like um, really the last year and a half she's really committed and it's been cool to see the progress absolutely I feel like yeah, these no, events are awesome fun. to watch. Like if you're at the bottom of the hill, like just looking up, that that would be amazing. It's pretty impressive. And I mean, it's it's really cool to see it from the side, you know, like to get close enough. Um, yeah, we got to get you out here, Devin. You know, can hear it. It's like a fighter jet coming by. Um, so we've got we've got somebody else who's gonna jump in here, Sarah. So hang, uh, I mean, obviously, just be aware. Um, we got a, another guest who's going to join us for the end of this round. Um, here comes our uh, Swedish competitor, Astrid Norstedt. So, Sarah, I was trying to explain. I think she's kind of a pioneer for Sweden ski jumping, right? Definitely. I never competed with her, actually, so I don't know the age. If you can if you can pull it up, that'd be great. But it's, again, amazing that th that's a country where there's no male ski jumpers um, at the international level. So it's pretty awesome that they've been able to find some girls passionate about the sport and um, have some awesome results within the team. So, I mean, that's just so exciting for us. We love seeing new nations um, evolve and um, yeah, that's, that's what it's all about. Totally. So it looks like Sam's in the lead right now and just kind of waiting to see what Ostrid does here. trying to find out how old uh um uh ostrid is we have josie johnson who started a couple years ago a few years ago now and just remember her little spitfire from the age when she started at, on the 10 meter she's improved so much and great hard worker great little athlete so it's awesome to see her having a good season and she's always having fun, which is huge. Yeah, she's amazing. She crushes it on the mountain bike too. She's a really, really good athlete. Her and Annika Belshaw, I swear they could go professional and 
mountain biking any day. So mm-hmm. we got to keep them around the ski jumping world. I think they're pretty committed. You mentioned Nordic Combined around Annika, and she's like 100% no way. <laughs> she's like, I'll win them once in a while, but that's it. Yeah, just, you know, I was I was pretty much that way. And, you know, since I've retired, I, I do a lot of mountain biking, biking myself, and think maybe, oh, that would, would have been a good idea. But, you know, we kind of specialized in ski jumping and stuck with that. Yeah. So this is Josephine. This is the last competitor who could possibly break up, I think, what's almost surely going to be an American sweep. Oh, man, I don't know. I don't I don't see that she's going to go up and or she's going to jump up enough to take take a podium spot. What do you think? Yeah, I um, I didn't know the point differential between first and second round. Definitely a pretty good looking jump this second jump. But uh, um, I don't know. I think she's it's going right. to be a fight for the podium for sure. Is this is this uh, are we to win this event? Is it total points or just for this jump? It's going to be total jump or total points cumulative from two jumps. So okay. right now, Josephine just launched into the lead, uh, two hundred and two points. So about twenty points ahead of Josie, but she's okay. got five Americans coming right now, starting with Anna Hoffman. Got it. And yeah, Sarah, Anna. what were your thoughts there on the last minute uh, reallocation there to to get Anna into the games? Yeah, it was uh, crazy. I. I'm going to nice looking jump from Anna. Good job. Um, yeah, I was uh, working at the hospital that day. I'm in nursing school, so I was at the hospital and I got a text from her before I'd the press release had come out, and she said, "I I'm going to the Olympics. What's your advice?" And um, I just thought it was really cute because I've known Anna for a long time, and we've um you know done some things together on the ski jumps and. Uh, it's just, uh, it was, it was awesome. It's great for the U S to, to have that spot. And I think it was really good experience for her. And, you know, I told her that she couldn't focus on those results at that Olympics to really just bring in the experience and motivate her to, um, train harder for the next one around where she can really, um, you know, jump to the top. Well, she just took a 12 point lead over Josephine. So she's, She's definitely trying to fight her way onto the podium here with Annika on her way down. Yeah. Oh. Nice. I think she pushed a little hard though. It looked like she lost that right tip a little bit, huh? Yeah, this hill is definitely uh a little, little bit difficult for her style. She's super good flyer, um, pretty aggressive jumper. Um, I know she tends to like larger hills better with more pressure on the skis. So this hill um, it's definitely more difficult for that, but you know, what doesn't hurt you will make you stronger and, you know, hopefully she can just gain a few, um, knowledge points from today and bring it over to tomorrow's comp. Yep. Well, Logan had a good first jump, so it'll be interesting to see if she can actually, she, she obviously has to have a few more meters to take over, take Anna, but she had a bit of an advantage coming into this one. Definitely, yeah. yeah that's, that's, um, that's the Steamboat Springs, right? Yep. yep and actually, so Anika. Kevin, uh, the Olympic Trials is like our first uh, objective. Ooh. Oh, yeah. So she came to play. So the Olympic Trials is the first objective criteria for us. Hey, Kaylee. Hi. Kaylee, hey, what's up? <laughs> Kaylee, we're just watching the last few athletes here at the uh, Park City Continental Cup for women's ski jumping. Where are you at? Uh, I'm in Carlsbad in right California. In. So it looks like Logan eked out Annika, or, uh, Anna. Um, she's, she actually took a pretty hefty lead with seven points. Um, but right what I was saying is, so Anna beat Logan by uh, half a point at Olympic trials, which then gave her the first spot for the games. So I think it's a very healthy, but it's a good rivalry within the team between those two right now. And then like we talked about Paige Jones coming back from an injury. Um, so as she goes, so Kaylee, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Congratulations. You know, I'm married to Katie Kaczynski Demung, who you know pretty well, I think, from your history in skeleton and bobsled. Um, she's taking tickets out there somewhere, you know, uh, in the dark behind. But great jump for Paige. 
Yeah, she's definitely had a good building season coming back from an injury, as Billy said, uh, probably about a year ago when she hurt her ankle. And um, I feel like it's been a good progressive um, recovery and uh, just really excited for her to build on it and, and keep going. So right now she just moved into second right in front of Anna. So we have Logan, Paige, and Anna, one, two, three, with Nina Lucy, the last competitor of the night, trying to stay on the top step here. Um, and then Kaylee, we, we want to catch up and hear what you've been up to ever since Beijing, but, uh, let's see what happens here. This is pretty intense. So down to the last competitor, Nina, this may be one of her last competitions. She's, um, she's not decided, I think, whether to continue or not, but That's ooh, a that good jump. A good jump. she's happy with it. That's close. That is going to be close. Definitely Logan, I think, took her on the second jump. But what the composite score shows. Yeah, definitely everyone oh. pushing each other, which is super good. So, yeah. um, looks like Logan. And Logan Sankey takes the victory. It's official on fists right now. Gotcha. So. Yeah, that was exciting, and I think we're gonna we're gonna stick around to the podium here in a minute. Um, I just wanted to uh, to ask you, Kaylee. So, so Beijing, Mono Bob, gold medal. You know, shared the podium with Alana, and what have you been up to since? And speaking about good rivalries, um, Alana and myself. I mean, that's a rivalry in and of itself. I've shared every Olympic podium I've had with her. And we've really gone back and forth. Even when I was a part of Team Canada, now both of us being on Team US, and having a rivalry, I think the same thing is so important in both oh. of us being able to push each other. As long as it remains respectful among competition, it really does help level the sport. Um, new events was something Alana and I really helped each other with, but it also grew the sport at the same time. So the rivalry definitely had and has benefits. Mono Bob being the addition uh, for women in sport in bobsled. Since the games, I've been mean, trying to unpack, just decompress a little bit. For us in bobsled, the Olympics ends our season, so we have nothing left, which is nice. It definitely adds a bit more pressure to the games, but at the same point, we get to come home and just relax and chill out, unpack. I feel like there was just so much build up to the games and just go, go, go that I pushed a lot of stuff aside. The amount of emails, catching up, family and friends I've got to connect with, but then also just coming down naturally from I'm sleeping naps. Like I am exhausted as a whole and I find I've got a giant to do list. And if I get one thing done a day, I'm lucky. Some days I literally just sit there and take my dog for a walk and that's pretty much the extent of what I'm able to do. So it really is hit and miss. Some days I'm very productive and other days I am probably the laziest person you've ever met in the entire world. So just trying to take it in stride and take it day by day right now. Well, good for you. I mean, I think everybody on this call, uh, Kayla, you know, Sarah, right? So Sarah's, I, know, uh, Sarah, I don't know if we've actually met in person, but uh, yes. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I obviously know your name quite well, but I don't think we actually have met. So nice to virtually meet you. Yes, you too. So, um, you know, I think, and Devin, I think, have you guys been on together? No, I don't think so, but I'm, so, I'm, 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 summer, I'm summer games. I'm a hurdler. Yeah. So, Kaylee, yeah. Devin's our top American uh, in the high hurdles. He got fourth in Tokyo. Um, and uh, it's been awesome. He's, I think he's as addicted to being on these shows as I am. Um, but I think we all totally get where you're coming from. Like, I don't think people realize like when you win a medal or you have a great result, sometimes your phone just blows up so hard. It takes like days to dig out again, you know, cause you don't want to like blow people off. But at the same point, it just wrecked your inbox on every channel you can imagine. You're just like, I don't even know. Um, when you're alone. trying to maximize, you, like you want to make sure that you're setting yourself up for future for whatever that is. You know, realistically certain opportunities only come around trying to maximize and you don't want to say no to people but at the same point you're tired and you need time for yourself and your family and friends and the people that have helped along the way as well so 
it it is it does take some getting used to it is a bit of a balance and trying to get that selfish time alone and just recover but also maximize opportunities and not miss anything and it yeah as every athlete here knows it definitely um is a unique feeling after the games for sure and i know lots about hurdles with my teammate being Alicia george and lolo jones yeah. definitely i could never do hurdles as a whole but understanding what it takes bobsledder too because the two hurdlers i know made amazing bobsledders so hey you, want to come out. you know may, may, maybe coming soon maybe 2026 <laughs> perfect Post you can do my basement, man. It's all good. Yeah. Come on over. Yeah, you know, this, that's a funny thing. Post-competition, you know, coming down off that high is, is really, really, you know, a thing, right? Like you were saying, like, you know, just walking your dog for the day is like the most you can do. For me, I was just like sitting on my computer playing video games for like 12 hours because I, I didn't want to do anything else. I was just like, I'm tired of working yeah. out. I'm tired of like eating healthy. I just want to like order pizza and not talk to anybody all day and you know ignore my coach and all that stuff so yeah 100 percent. you just need to turn off just switch off stop everything and i think that's a hundred percent normal and from everybody i've talked to literally everyone what's that sarah so we... like little cabins up there at the top nice to see you guys are you taking off? Take it off. I gotta okay. head out. All right, sir. Thanks so much for joining. This is like a cool experiment. I love the fact that we're able to pull this off. So, um, thanks a lot. Say hi to Colorado, and uh, hopefully catch up with you this spring. Absolutely. See you guys. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jamie, we're gonna have the question here. For you real quick. Um, you know, yep, so, you know, let's just, let's just keep rolling here. I'd love to show this, but again, just to recap for the viewers, like Logan Sankey managed to uh, climb up, I think from, it was third place, maybe even, yeah, it was third or fourth place actually uh, coming into the second round to take the win over Nina Lucy. Um, and then Paige Jones on her comeback year from her injury last year, almost exactly a year ago to take the, the third spot on the podium. Anna Hoffman was maybe Kaylee ran into her over in Beijing, our sole women's ski jumper this time around. Uh, but as Sarah shared, like, I think really good that we were able to send a woman this year, you know, that young team that's really on this list right now, you know, I think it's really good to not have that, like, oh, we didn't get to go this time. And Anna was able to crack that um, and had a, had a great time over there. Um, and really, you know, you can see just rounding out the top 10, Annika Belshaw, Josie Johnson, and Samantha Masuga and Kara Larson from Team USA with a couple of the Europeans that are here in the middle. But, you know, great competition. Um, going back kind of just while we're waiting here. So, Devin, um, did you were you able to watch the women's uh, mono, Bob, that Kaylee won? Yes, I did, actually. And I, I don't remember if we talked about this on FanFest or not, but or on World's Greatest. But, Kaylee, one of the things that I find fascinating and also really, really interesting is you know, like equipment plays such a role, especially in winter sports. And when you take like the equipment advantage out, like you guys totally dominated, you know, like, so just for everybody's sake at home, like most bobsledding events are run with team equipment. So if Germany has better equipment than another country, Germans tend to do better, but you don't really know that with mono bob it's actually a set of sleds it's basically like you draw a number out of a hat and you get that sled but they're all the same and so at the olympics it's it's a very even playing field i mean kaylee what was that like or you know do you like that format was that something you'd want to see in like two man it's definitely something i'd want to see more in the sport of offset at first when it came out i thought this is not going to work um they've had to tweak the way they do things a little bit the country actually can own their own sleds but they all have to come from the same manufacturer okay. you're not allowed to chop and change them which makes them uniform in monobob that's it which makes them uniform which is nice so it takes the problem in what we're seeing and what you probably saw if you watched any other bobsled event the germans dominated one two and men they swept the podium they won skeleton luge the Germans won nine of the 10 Olympic gold medals um, that were offered in all of the sliding sports as a whole. 
Um, they put a lot of money and invest a lot of money into their equipment. Unfortunately, not a lot of these countries have that option, which is part of why Monobob was added in the first place, was to open the door for smaller nations, to allow women that don't have a lot of access to super expensive equipment, as well as a lot of other girls and women and coaches to come in. Know about this? I know how important equipment is. I'm from a bigger nation, so I like that we're always right on the edge, pushing the limits. But at the same point, since having it and knowing that Team USA owns three sleds, so the sleds we were able to ship, I got to drive for the year. They're taking safety into account, but it does make them all regulated. is really nice because it does take the equipment piece out of it. It comes down to your athletic ability, which is what the Olympics should be about. How fast you push the sled, how well you drive, not how much money you have or how many years your program has been investing or who, who your program aligns with, whether it be FES or, you know, Ferrari or Bodine or whoever else, BMW. It just comes down to pushing and driving, which is the skill of the athlete. So I really do hope in the future that two men and four men do go this direction and that the the countries are allowed to own their equipment and the athletes can have use of that equipment for the entire year. The, the carousel that they originally started with years and years ago of, you know, the IBSF, our international federation, keeps all the sleds and you just get drawn a number out of a hat. That doesn't quite work for me because of the way we have to set up the sleds. How I sit is different than, you know, a girl who's 5'1 or 6'2". Um, right, of course. And just kind of like in a car, you move your seat back and forth where the steering wheel is. Everything is set up for us individually to drive down comfortably and safely. So you can't chop and change too much, but I like the fact that the nations can buy the sleds that come from the same factory and you're not allowed to change them. You're, you're allowed to add some padding and move your seat and your foot pegs and stuff, but that's it. You're not allowed to like change articulation or springs or any of that kind of stuff. And so it does make it a lot more fair, which is where you see Australia won a couple World Cups this year. Um, yeah. Canada was up there. Some of the rookie girls that we're not used to seeing have a chance to be on the podium now. So I think it does change the game of the sport and for the better. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's funny, you know, obviously skiing is the worst, right? Because not only do you have equipment, you also have like wax, right? Everything's changing every day. And you see the Norwegian wax truck pull and you've probably seen it driving around Europe. It's like a semi truck that folds up and out. You know, they've got 24 techs in there. Most teams have two. So you know, it is, it's really frustrating when you know, like the difference is really not the person, it's the equipment. Um, you know, even in ski jumping, a lot of the things that we're dealing with are, you know, different bindings, different skis, obviously the suits are your wings. And so um, I would love to see uh, more regulation in our sport. But the, the problem is, and you've probably seen it, Kaylee, is like, the more you try to regulate, the more rules you write, the more likely you are to actually create a, uh, like a difference that a bigger team with more money and more brain power can actually think through and find a new advantage. That's what we keep running into in, in especially in ski jumping. Yeah, and they will, but they're always gonna do that. They're always gonna, at least when you change it for a bit and what we found with Mono, there's only so many things they can change then. You set the rules, you make them. Yeah, they're always going to be looking for new advantages, but the advantages that they can gain are small and they have to do a whole bunch of them. Right. Whereas right now, just leaving it alone allows for those bigger advantages and the bigger amounts of money and dollars to make such drastic change. Yeah. Um, and they get a, more of a monopoly over things. So um, they're always going to find advantages. this is their sport and what they love and what that I think we lost her um Kayla if you're coming back uh so we we're just finishing up the podium here um obviously team USA psyched to be taking five of the top five spots here or five of the top six it looks like our German friend Josephine was able to crack into the the top five but I just want to give one more PSA thank you to our our, our sponsors at the event Summit County Restaurant Tax Utah, Life Elevated, obviously, and uh, Backcountry.com for the amazing apparel that they've been able to provide us and support our 
our jumpsuit program this year as well. Um, shout big shout outs. So, um, Kaylee, I uh, really appreciate you joining us. I think we're about to end the feed. Um, let's stay in touch, though. And uh, Devin, yes. I'm sure I'll uh, I'll be talking to you. I've got your cell number now. I think I, I finally saved it. So um, oh. you're ready to come. Took and you long enough. What's that? So it took you long enough. Well, you know, it's been a busy couple of weeks. Uh, no, but I'm looking forward to that ski trip. Kaylee, when are you coming out here? To Placid? Oh, I, I'm actually in Park City oh, right Park now. City. But I will be in Park City. in two weeks if you're around. Devin's, Devin's threatening to come up. Well, well you I know what's crazy is... Ropes if he's going to be a bobsledder in the future. But... Hey, I'm in San Diego right now. That's a quick trip to Carlsbad. I don't right? know. I'm, I'm feeling we like... Need we need to go like, like, for coffee. I'll tell you the you know, before you before you go to, I have one quick question, and I, you know, I'm interested yeah. just about the sport in general. Um, you know, the basis of of you know being competitive in um, in the event is being fast, being able to push fast, and be able to steer, like you said. What do you think is your biggest advantage over your competitors? Right, like in my event, I'm you know the hurdles. There's a you know jumping aspect, but my biggest advantage is being faster than most of the competitors. What's your, what's one of your biggest advantages when you, when it comes to the event? Are you, you know, Lewis Hamilton out there on the track or are you Usain Bolt pushing, pushing that thing? More Lewis Hamilton. Okay. My advantage is in my, I, I'm definitely a lot more detail orientated than most and my ability, my coachability and my ability to recognize and change on the fly as we're driving down um, and to drive down very quickly is one of my greater skills. So in Beijing, the track being longer, I was able to make up a bit of a time deficit at the start that I had. So I'm good enough at the start. I am fairly fast yeah, and I'm I mean, strong, but I'm not yeah. the best at both. At the same point, my skill in, in being able to drive a bobsled um, is far superior to most so that definitely is my advantage. I can drive really well. That's great. Yeah, and it, you know, I I saw a couple of tweets from Stu while you were um, competing. You know, and if you have if you have Stu Stu with you, you you're gonna be fast for sure. Yeah, yeah. I was I lucked out on that one. Stu's been my coach since 2007. So yeah, McMillan has taught me a lot. So I was able to start with him early enough where again speed i'm not naturally a fast person so he has maxed me out to the most of my oh, ability yeah, trying yeah. to be as fast as are. possible oh how about now yeah i can hear you now good okay yeah Stu has maxed Maybe. out my my speed ability for sure which is good but um we focus on it again in bobsled you don't just need speed you need strength and more explosive power so what you have to get over the hurdle while being fast is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I can get away with being not quite as fast. But at the same point, I know who the best are and I go seek that out in order to be the best. And yep. for me, training, a big portion of that has been Stu. Shout out Stu. He's a good guy. Awesome. Well, Kaylee, we're going to wrap things up here. Thanks a lot for joining. Um, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch about the uh, world's greatest get together. Um, but, uh, uh, so, uh, thanks with that, yeah, thanks a lot for being on, uh, Devin, thanks a lot for joining me to host, uh, our event here in park city. Um, look forward to having you out for a little ski date here. Uh, I, I, I'm a hundred percent coming out. So we're going to, when I do decide, you know, probably post season, off season, you know, in the winter, maybe October, November, I'm going to, we're going to bring the whole crew out. Let's do it. Awesome. Well, we'll be in touch on that. Um, <clears throat> again, thanks to the big, uh, to our partners, backcountry.com, the state of Utah, Life Elevated, and the Summit County Restaurant Tax Grant. Um, Devin Allen, I, I love where we're going with this. I think uh, for a first time trying to do a talk show over a comp uh, competition, we did pretty well. So looking forward to getting together with you and Bob and the team after this and trying to figure out how to do it again and even better in the future. So shout out to world's greatest fan fest and, uh, and squawk productions here in park city.
for capturing the the content on the ground. And thanks for all of you at home for for being patient as we work through a couple of bugs today. But I mean, again, live live stream is is a bare bones version of live TV, and uh, it's really cool. Everybody's going to be uh, raising a glass here in a minute and is celebrating a, a great show. So thanks for tuning in. And Devin, you got anything to add? You ready? No. Uh, what's that? Thanks for thanks for having me. You know, I'm I'm loving learning about the sport. I'm lo- loving learning about you know, a lot of things that, that I don't do personally and, and getting the chance to interact with the fans is great as well. And, and seeing these live events, which, you know, we talk about how important it is for Olympic sports, especially to get exposure and, and, and people have the opportunity to watch them and, you know, in turn, you know, the opportunity for the athletes to be seen, uh, which is great. So I really appreciate, you know, world's greatest. I appreciate you guys, um, you know, for putting this on. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, thanks a lot. And, uh, we'll be, uh, we'll be hooking up over text here in a minute and, uh, and everybody at home until tomorrow morning. Peace out. Peace out.